Thank you, Aditi. It's a pleasure to be here. It's interesting that we're at 726 Broadway. If you go north on Broadway far enough, it turns into New York State Route 9 and eventually goes to Albany, Glens Falls, Lake George, Chestertown. And then if you turn right and go two miles, you go to the village of Brent Lake that I grew up in. Uh, <laughs> so I feel uh, sort of connected there. Uh, it was a very small village. There were five kids in my high school class. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so I'm going to talk to you about Schrodinger cats and Maxwell's uh, demon and quantum error correction and uh, a particular scheme that was done in the experiment by my friends here uh, comes from uh, one of our collaborators, Maziar Mirahimi and, uh, and Zaki Lakitas and um, I've uh, worked with uh, Liang Zhang and these guys on some extensions of this idea, which are now sort of the next generation of the experiment that I won't really have time to talk about. Um, but uh, let's start with a quiz. Uh, <laughs> I should have given the graduate students uh, after lunch the answers in advance. But don't worry, I'm actually going to give you the answers. So. Uh, so is quantum information carried by waves or particles? Yes. There is no wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> is quantum information analog or digital? So it turns out, of course it's analog. You know, the state of a spin half can be continuously turned on the block sphere. Errors in states, which we want to correct, uh, can, can you can have over rotations, you can have continuously developing uncertainty about the phase and so forth. So they're continuous, but measured errors are discrete. So uh, you know when you measure something, you, okay, we use these words, you collapse the state, we won't, let's not have a fight about what that means, but you know what I mean. Uh, so if you collapse the state of the error without collapsing the state of the thing that's holding your information, you get a discrete error. And that's much easier to fix than a continuous error. And that's sort of the trick that makes uh, error correction work. So, uh, so quantum, maybe you've heard talks about quantum computing, it's a, it's a sort of this is something that could have been figured out in 1930. It's not it's the same old Schrodinger equation and ideas, but the implications of quantum mechanics are so weird and, and counterintuitive that people missed uh, for uh, 50 years or 60 years the, some of the things that can happen in terms of the information content of quantum states and their ability to manipulate information. And uh, we always um, used to think of the uncertainty principle as something bad. Uh, quantum mechanically, you can kind of know less than uh, uh, you could classically. So it seemed like a bug in the program of the universe. But actually, people have come to understand that it's a feature that instead of saying, I'm building, a, I'm an idiot, I'm building a computer where I don't know whether the bits are zero or one. You're saying, no, I'm a genius, I'm building a computer where it's both zero and one at the same time, so I can do exponentially many more things in parallel because uh, quantum mechanics is linear and I can, in a kind of massive parallelism, I can work on every input state that I could ever give the computer all at the same time. Of course, I get a giant mess at the output because it's a superposition of all the possible answers. So uh, we have to find some clever algorithms where that doesn't become a problem. And uh, <coughs> the other thing that makes com quantum computers powerful is entanglement. And um, uh, the bits in the computer can have non-classical correlations that are stronger than any classical uh, system can have. And Einstein objected strenuously to this, of course, and that was because he understood quantum mechanics much better than anybody else and knew this was a st very strange uh, uh, thing that you would have to give up local realism, so something he called spooky action at a distance. 
And the irony is that like our daily warm-up engineering test to see if our quantum computers are working in the lab is we do this thing that Einstein said was impossible, and then we know we have a quantum computer and not a classical computer. So Albert is uh, helping us out. So a register of n conventional bits, of course, can be in one of two to the n states. So three bits could be one of eight. Uh, the quantum register can be in an arbitrary superposition of all those at the same time. There are many such, there's two to the n orthogonal states, but there are many, many different superpositions, and a, you know, a simple way of counting them gives you two to the t to the n, uh, which grows um, obviously extremely rapidly with n. So, even a small, you know, people say, oh, you know, you're never going to build a computer with 10 million bits or 100 million bits. That act might actually be true. Uh, but um, companies are now releasing press releases saying they are working on 50 qubits, which, you know, if they were actually working, they would have said something else in the press release. <laughs> uh, but 2 to the 50 is a pretty gigantic Hilbert space and is at the current limit of what can be uh, hand-coded on a classical computer to simulate, assuming the bits only have two levels. Uh, they actually have many more levels, and there's photons and communication buses and things, so it would probably, even at this very small scale, you would have a computer that's quite powerful and quite impossible to simulate on a classical computer. That's assuming they're all computational qubits, that you don't have to use some for arithmetic. Uh, uh, well, to simulate it, it's just physical qubits. To actually use it, it would be interesting to have 50 logical qubits, yes. Uh, so there are various things you can do with it. Um, you got to be careful about claims about doing machine learning, but in principle it might be possible. But one of the things you can do is uh, solve the Schrodinger equation even with fermion and minus signs uh, and do electronic structure calculations which could uh, and there are papers being published now experimental papers doing incredibly crude quantum chemistry calculations on small quantum computers so it's very very early days but uh, th there's some interesting things that can be done there so this all sounds great, uh, storing information and manipulating it in quantum states, uh, but how do, you, how do you actually build a quantum computer? Well, there are different technologies, uh, every, you know, all based on whatever you did your PhD on. Uh, and um, so I'm going to um, talk to you about some of those and uh, involving, like some people did their PhDs on atoms and they want to use the quantized energy levels of atoms and the fact that you can make superpositions of those energy states, uh, so trapped ions <coughs> or um, uh, uh, cold atoms. Um, we're going to do superconducting uh, electrical circuits. Here is a superconducting LC oscillator. It's not a very good atom because all the energy levels are evenly spaced, but we'll fix that in a second. Uh, contains around a trillion electrons. If I gave you a molecule with a trillion electrons, you would be hard pressed to show me the spaghetti of energy levels in the spectrum, and it would be horrible. Uh, but because it's superconducting and the electrons are moving collectively, it's a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, and uh, it has a millimeter uh, uh, size scale. You can see it with your naked eye if you're young, at least. Uh, you have to operate them at 10 millikelvin, but you can make them by electron beam lithography by the same technology that computer chips are made. So maybe that means it can be, it's not a proof you can scale it up to large numbers of bits, but at least it's vaguely plausible. Now, the transistor of, or maybe the vacuum tube, I'm not sure, <laughs> of the quantum computing world and superconducting qubits is the Josen junction. So I have superconducting uh, aluminum, another piece of superconducting aluminum, <coughs> one nanometer of aluminum oxide tunnel barrier, and the electrons are waves and can tunnel through that barrier and uh, in, uh, as Cooper pairs, as pairs of electrons. 
and uh, that discrete tunneling, one electron, at, one pair at a time, is going to provide that harmonic oscillator with some anharmonicity, as I'll explain in a second. Sorry, why there is this little stellar H on the top? Um, so this is just how it's, uh, you, you evaporate the first piece of aluminum, you expose it to uh, this extra oxygen. Sort of this, yes. Yeah, that's just that the second piece I is the, the way it's evaporated. Uh, in, in the way it's constructed. Yeah. So this is what it actually looks like. It's pretty ugly, but uh, amazingly, and there are grain boundaries and things in there, it doesn't seem to matter. There's, so far, we haven't detected significant dissipation from imperfections in the junction itself. But what it does do, it acts like an inductor that's nonlinear, whose inductance varies with the amount of current that's flowing in it. And so our LC oscillator uh, can become anharmonic. And the transition frequency from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3, they all have different frequencies. And so they're sep those transitions are separately addressable, just like in an atom. Okay. So here is the, the what we call a transmon <coughs> qubit, just the world's simplest one. It's one that everybody has adopted. Uh, uh, after it was developed in, in, uh, by Rob Sholkoff, is a sapphire substrate. There's a little millimeter dipole antenna, and the two halves are connected by a Josen junction. And uh, the, uh, there's instead of, um, so there's energy stored in the capacitance across here, and energy stored in the current flowing as the electron pairs slosh back and forth. And it, it's equivalent to a particle in a cosine potential. So it's softer than a parabola, so it uh, has negative anharmonicity. The frequency to go from the ground state to the first excited state is maybe 5 gigahertz, and this is maybe 4.8 gigahertz, so 200 megahertz less. Uh, and so I can address this transition as a two-level system and ignore the higher levels. So the excitations of this qubit are supercurrents sloshing back and forth across the antenna pads. The superconductivity gaps out all the single particle excitations in the, in the Fermi C of those trillion electrons and simplifies the spectrum. Um, the quantized energy level spectrum is that of an anharmonic oscillator. It's simpler than hydrogen. There's no fine structure, no hyperfine structure. And the quality factor, the transition frequency times the spontaneous emission lifetime of the excited state to spontaneously emit a photon is about the same as a hydrogen 2p to 1s transition. So it's a pretty good atom. It took a few years to make it that good, but it, it's that good now. Uh, the dipole moment, however, makes it a spectacularly good atom. It's the dipole moment for the transition is several Cooper pairs moving a millimeter. So it's tens or hundreds of thousands of times bigger than uh, rubidium atom and thousands of times bigger than even the big Rydberg atoms. Uh, and so, and we can put them in cavity, centimeter scale cavities that are only half a wavelength across. So you get all the vacuum energy, zero point fluctuation energies of the electric field squeezed in around this big antenna, and you get enormous coupling of these atoms to the uh, microwave, quantized microwave field. And you can do cavity QED, which we call uh, circuit QED here, in uh, a limit of extremely ultra strong coupling. You can kind of engineer your way around the small size of the fine structure constant. So you can do nonlinear optics in a way with parameters that atomic physicists uh, 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 would, would really love to have. When we started this, say, you know, we got invited to atomic physics conferences and they said, oh, isn't that cute? But after we started crushing them, they got up. <laughs> so this circuit QED was used to build the world's first electronic quantum computer. It only had two qubits in it. They talked to each other by virtual exchange of microwave photons through this little meander line. 
uh, was built by my friends here, and um, it executed simple quantum algorithms and did things that, even though it was only two qubits, it did things that uh, <coughs> are not possible uh, classically. Okay, so, uh, and there's been great progress uh, since 2009 in this area. And, okay, so now, uh, all this magic power of superpositions and entanglement it gives us a great power to do certain kinds of computations exponentially faster than classically <coughs> uh, comes with a price. There's a kind of uh, Achilles tendon that uh, there's a great sensitivity to noise, perturbations, dissipation. But you, you can't, neither you nor the environment is allowed to look inside the computer during the calculation because you'll collapse the delicate state and, and it, it won't work. Okay. So, uh, so the, if you made a superposition state with a certain phase, that phase will become perturbed and, and randomized and no longer well defined after some finite coherence time which in NMR language is called uh, T2. And uh, that time is uh, not very long. But despite this sensitivity, there's been just literally exponential progress since the first <coughs> fit was made in Japan by Nakamura in 1998. There's been nearly six orders of magnitude increase in coherence time. This is the same, this is the same data with a Yale plot and an MIT plot uh, from Will Oliver. And there have been all kinds of uh, these are artificial atoms. You, if you don't like their properties, you can re-engineer them. And uh, there's been tremendous progress in increasing their uh, coherence times from nanoseconds to now milliseconds. Uh, and this, this may well keep going. It's pro probably reaching the stage where material science will have to come in uh, to help us make things better. Uh, and e but even if it keeps going, I have to tell you about a new law of physics, which I modestly <laughs> named Kerman's Law, <laughs> which is that there's no such thing as too much coherence. Uh, you know, if you can make the coherence time one second, somebody's going to come and say, I got a great calculation I want to do on your computer, but it's going to take two seconds. There's just, mm -hmm. there's n n there's just no such thing as too much coherence. And that means that even if the physics of making the coherence time keeps getting better and better. We're still going to need quantum error correction. So that's the that's what I'm going to be talking about. So here's the quantum error correction problem in a nutshell. I'm going to give you an unknown <coughs> quantum state. I mean, I think a known state. You know, it's not you can reproduce it later. Uh, but if I give you an unknown state and if you look at it to see if there's an error, it's going to cause some kind of back action or state collapse. If it develops an error, please fix it anyway. Right? Seems impossible, but miraculously, it can be done. And to me, the fact that, at least in principle, it's possible to correct errors, unknown errors, in unknown states and get back the original unknown state uh, is much more remarkable than the fact that you could use quantum states to do computation. It just seems crazily uh, impossible. So how does it work? So you have to take some number of physical qubits and assemble them into what's called a logical qubit, some uh, collective state and you have to store the <coughs> quantum information. So what is the quantum information? If I have a two-level system, it's the coefficient in the wave function of 0 and 1, or ground and excited, right? <coughs> Those complex numbers, that's my quantum information. I have to store that in this state in some weird non-local, non-classical correlations among the physical qubits in such a way that it's kind of non-local and no single physical qubit knows what the quantum state is of the logical qubit that I'm trying to store. Because if it did know, 
that the environment could reach in and, and measure it or probe it and learn something about the, the logical state you're trying to store, and then it would collapse. Okay? So if this is going to be robust against, let's say, one error, one physical error, no s one qubit can know what the state is that I'm stored. It has to be non-locally distributed. Then, uh, so there's some kind of code that we have to develop of the uh, correlated states to store the information. Then we need to build a Maxwell daemon, also out of imperfect parts, by the way. And that Maxwell daemon has to figure out the errors which are causing entropy and, and errors and pump it out into some cold bath uh, to get rid of it. And right away, Every quantum error correction setup has the following problem. If I use n physical qubits to, to make one logical qubit, and they all have uh, you know, independent errors, right away I've made the error rate n times larger. In this case, n is 9. If I took a giant step backward, I made the error rate 9 times worse. So my Maxwell daemon has to be so nearly perfect and so fast that it can find the errors and get rid of them to overcome that factor of 9. If I do that, I, I've only broken even. I've reached the break-even point. I haven't made anything better. But hopefully it's so good that I can make it, you know, uh, the error rate is now uh, not equal to what it was when I was just storing the information in one, but much lower. Okay? So that's called uh, exceeding the break-even point. And also, since this is made of imperfect parts, it can introduce errors on its own. Or it could misread the situation and tell you there's an error when there isn't one, and then you could fix it, and that would introduce an error. So uh, it's not so easy. Well, so there's a whole literature, including experimental literature, on quantum error correction. None of the titles or abstracts advertise the fact that none of them reached break-even. That every time you ran the algorithm, you made things worse than doing nothing. Uh, okay, so uh, all previous attempts to reach the break-even point have failed. I'm going to tell you about the first experiment uh, that succeeded. So. The current approach taken, uh, this is my one uh, provocative slide, <laughs> by our friends in industry, and they are our friends because most of them graduated from our group, is to scale up to large sizes with a whole bunch of qubits and then try to figure out how to control them and how to then use them for quantum error correction. And there are some very interesting logical qubits, for example, the surface code, which is a big uh, fabric of qubits and it has some topological properties and you you run around making uh, measurements of four qubits at a time wait for operators like z z z z or x x x x uh, and you need lots of wires one for each of these and lots of fancy measurements you have to do it very fast and then uh, you, sh you might be able to, um, to break even. But it's very complicated. There's some technical limitations for this uh, type of uh, memory, but it's just very, very hardware inefficient. And uh, uh, you know, estimates suggest that it's going to be very difficult to reach the break even without substantial technical progress, although uh, According to the press releases, uh, work is underway. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we think you should have a simpler idea, which is very, very hardware efficient. Just very few moving parts that can achieve error correction with and great precision, and then scale those up. Okay, so error correct and then scale up. And we're going to do it not by using any material object as the qubit. We're going to have just an empty box filled with vacuum, uh, surrounded by aluminum walls, and we're going to store the information in microwave photons in that empty box. 
So uh, instead of this complicated thing, and I haven't even shown all the wiring, we're going to uh, use this, and I'm showing you all the wiring. So there's an empty box, aluminum resonator, that can hold different states of photons, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, plus 4, uh, whatever you want. Uh, there's a little, the thing that everybody else calls the qubit, the transmon, for us is just going to be, the qubit is going to be here. The transmon is just going to be a nonlinear oscillator that gives us universal control and allows us to make non-classical states in the resonator. And there's another little uh, two-dimensional resonator here, and then one wire that comes out, and that's it. And that one wire at frequencies that where this resonates can control this resonator, at frequencies where the atom has a transition can control that, and at uh, frequencies where the, this high Q storage resonator resonates can control that. And you, it turns out that with these guys, you can do complete state <coughs> tomography. You can read out the state of this complicated system all through this one wire, and you can control all the parts through that one wire. So it's a very simple, uh, very simple setup. Okay, and why is it advantageous? Well, the uh, cavities are, they have no moving parts. They're just empty boxes. You can make a Q of 100 million, uh, half a <coughs> billion uh, millisecond lifetimes. The harmonic oscillator has a larger Hilbert space. It can have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 photons. So they can, that larger Hilbert space can represent several physical qubits and allow you to, do, you know, have the parts you need to do error correction, and yet it's just an empty box. There aren't actually any more parts. It has a very simple error model. It's entirely dominated by the fact that it's a damped oscillator. It loses photons every once in a while, not very fast. And as I said, there's a single readout channel, which turns out you can <coughs> measure the entire state, how many photons and the coherences and so forth uh, in this system with a single wire. Okay, so we need to figure out how to store quantum information in superpositions of photon states. So how do we do that? Well, we need two code words. Two quantum states made out of different numbers of photons. I'm going to call one of them zero logical and the other one logical. So this could be like zero photon in the cavity and one photon in the cavity or something more complicated. This could be zero plus four. And this could be two. And the quantum information we're going to store is in the complex amplitudes in the superposition of those two different orthogonal photon states of the cavity, okay? And we're going to choose these logical states, these superpositions of photons, in a clever way that even if you lose a photon, we'll be able to recover and restore this original state, okay? Questions about that? But in principle, you have an infinite number of letters? Uh, in principle, uh, at some point, it, the fact that it's slightly inharmonic or other problems uh, begin to appear. Uh, but you have a, a large number. But we have a significant number, yeah. And you're only using two. Uh, no, no, we're going to use um, some coherent states and cat states, which uh, uh, are superpositions of many different n, but out of that whole space, we're going to use only two, one to be logical zero and one to be logical one. But they will each have several photons. But isn't it a bit of a waste? I mean, I know this case in that no, case because case. just as I had like that code where I had nine physical qubits, mm -hmm. you have to have a bigger Hilbert space. And then you use a subset of it with some symmetries. And you measure those symmetries. And if they ever fail, that means there's an error. You, you, you have to do that to do error correction. There's no way around it. OK, uh, so uh, and again, this nonlinear oscillator is not the qubit. This is. But this will give us universal control that lets us make the fancy code words and superpositions of them that we need.
Okay, so now I'll, I'll just remind you uh, about harmonic oscillators. Uh, and I'm, uh, normally when you talk about photons, you use second quantization, but I'm going to use a little known technique called first quantization. <laughs> so I'll just remind <laughs> my uh, harmonic oscillator, that cavity is morally equivalent to an LC oscillator. The uh, coordinate is the flux in the inductor. The momentum conjugate, conjugate to that is the charge on the capacitor. You just turn them into operators. You quantize them. Uh, and you can have a wave function. The coordinate of the oscillator is, let's say, the flux through the coil. And the wave function, the square of that tells you the probability that if I measured the flux in the coil, I would get that number. And it's, of course, a Gaussian. This is the zero point fluctuations of the, uh, the magnetic field, uh, or you can choose the electric field for the coordinate, it doesn't matter. The first excited state is the coordinate times a Gaussian, right, in the, for a harmonic oscillator. And that says that there's zero probability that the flux is zero, it's most likely this or that. Right? Those are the classical turning point values. That's the one photon state. And uh, we're going to deal with coherent states. Coherent states are what are created when you have a classical signal generator, a microwave generator. It's like our laser. You just send this classical signal down. It starts the oscillator ringing. It displaces the state, keeping the Gaussian shape, but just moves it away from the origin by a distance alpha. The mean photon number in the state is alpha squared. So alpha is in units of amplitude in units of square root of photon number. This is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian because if you have a mass on a spring and you pull it and let it go, it moves. How do things move in quantum mechanics? By not being stationary states, by not being energy eigenstates. And in fact, it has a Poisson distribution of photon number uh, in it with a width square root of n bar. So you're only using one mode here? Uh, yeah, so these are, uh, these, unlike optical Fabry Pro cavities, which might be 100,000 wavelengths long, these are one to a half wavelength between the mirrors. And so the, the frequency separation among the modes is very large, and we can focus on just one. Uh, I mean, you can also make the cavities longer and use more modes that people also do that. But for our purposes, I'm just thinking in one mode. So uh, I'm going to do a, show you a lot of phase space pictures. So this is coordinate, this is momentum, and a classical coherent state is just, you know, you're displaced some momentum and some uh, position. This goes this way in uh, phase space, 5 billion times per second. So we're going to go into a rotating frame where it sits still. Uh, and I'm going to, um, <coughs> quantum mechanically, you're not at a sharp point because position and momentum don't commute. So there's a sort of uh, fuzzy blob uh, at the end of this due to vacuum fluctuations. Okay? So this is the closest fuzzy blob in, in phase space is the closest thing to a classical sine wave that you can <coughs> get. It's still... If you measure the energy, yes, it's quantized, but it's, uh, it's essentially a classical state. So uh, here is an experiment that measures the photon number distribution in the cavity. Uh, how, does it, how did we do that? Well, the inside the ca or coupled to the cavity is one of these transmon ancillas. And the cavity is a harmonic oscillator. I'm going to only work with the lowest two levels of the transmon, so I'm going to pretend it's a fake spin and half. So spin down is ground state, spin up is first excited state. I'm going to ignore the higher excited states. And they're uh, detuned from each other. The, the frequency of the cavity and the frequency of the qubit are different. So the qubit cannot absorb the photon from the cavity. The photon can jump in there by the dipole transition, but it has to jump out immediately because it doesn't conserve energy. 
And in second order perturbation theory, the net effect is this so-called dispersive coupling, which says that uh, there's a term in the energy, chi uh, sigma z a dagger a. And one way to interpret this term is that the coefficient of sigma z, which is the qubit frequency, depends on how many photons are in the cavity. So simply by using a tone and doing spec what's called quantum jump spectroscopy, I see if I can flip the qubit by applying a certain frequency. If I succeed, I can read it out by this same term because the cavity frequency will change. Uh, and here is the time average spectrum of our atom in a cavity that's being driven that has a coherent state in it. And you see uh, the transition frequency for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 photons in the cavity. I told you these were split by 3,000 line widths. It doesn't look like it here because the graduate students were in a hurry and power broadened the lines by a factor of 100. But, uh, so how, how, how do you assign the photon number to these? Uh, uh, so it, you uh, would buy, so, so these are sitting at 10 millikelvin. You should know that one kelvin is 21 gigahertz. Okay. So five kelvin is a quarter of a, uh, five gigahertz is a quarter of a kelvin. So it should be f thermally frozen out in the ground state. So if we don't drive it, uh, and actually the photon number is about 10 to the minus three or something. So, uh, so what you have when you're not driving it, that's zero. And also we can, uh, we know how to calculate the frequencies of the qubit before we cool them down to, to a fraction of a percent. So, uh, you know, the, we know where to look for the zero photon line. And then we, uh, we add uh, a drive and, and put the coherent state in there. Good question. Uh, I mean, if it were, and these are not like cesium, where you know exactly the frequency before you <laughs> do the experiment. But we know it. We can calculate it uh, to a fraction of a percent. So you should learn from this curve that <laughs> microwaves are not waves. They're particles. Right? They, they're quanta. They're just as good as the ones that you, know, you can see with your eye. They just have 100,000 times less energy. And actually, the fact that we can do a quantum non-demolition measurement of their number uh, suggests a way to do axion dark matter searches vastly more efficiently than the current schemes that are being used. So we have, you know, we have a crazy paper on that topic. We may never build a quantum computer, but maybe we'll find dark matter. <laughs> okay. So, um, so now back to error correction. So. Uh, we're not going to use coherent states. There, there's just you know, there's just one state. Uh, it's uh, we need something more complicated. We're going to use Schrodinger cat states, which are superpositions. They're coherent superpositions of coherent states. So the cavity perhaps has this amplitude, perhaps has this amplitude, and it's in a superposition of both with either a plus sign or a minus sign. So uh, this, st the wave function looks like this. It has reflection parity in the coordinates, so it's only made of even photon numbers. This has odd spatial parity. It has only odd photon numbers. So even cat and odd cat. These are superpositions of two different, you know, mesoscopic or mac macroscopic states. The largest we've made has 111 photons in it, perhaps the most macroscopic coherent superposition ever created. And um, uh, it seems crazy to try to use these because they're well known to be extremely delicate. So how big do they have, and since they are not orthonormal, uh, it's an overcomplete basis. Uh, the one yeah, the so uh, mm -hmm. once these blobs are far enough apart that they're hardly overlapping. So far enough means like a couple of... Uh, yeah, one, uh, of one and a half photons yeah. is plenty big. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's actually, the, these are exactly orthogonal because they have different parity, but uh, the normalization is not mm -hmm. quite root two. This differs by some exponentially small correction. Okay, so uh, let's look at the parity of these things. So here's my uh, coherent state. 
I'm not going to, it's the whole story of how we make these cats. Uh, but I'll just tell you that because we have that nonlinear ancilla, we have universe, provably universal control, and we can make them. So here's an even cat, and here's an odd cat. And you can see by the fact that only odd numbers are present that it has odd parity. That means that you really do have a coherent superposition. There is interference that kills the even numbers when you're in the odd cat state and vice versa. It's not a mixture of this and that, because then you would get this. Is that clear? Okay. So these are eigenstates of the parity operator, uh, uh, minus 1 to the e to the i pi number. Okay, so the whole uh, thing, that the whole enabling technology is that we can measure parity without measuring photon number. And, um, uh, you know, if, as I told the graduate students uh, after lunch, you know, one way to measure parity is to measure the number by this spectroscopy. Let's say it comes out 7, then I have a lookup table, oh, 7 is odd. Well. <laughs> Uh, fine, you learn the parity, but it's very dangerous to learn more than you want to know. There's too much information in quantum mechanics because the more information you learn, the more collapse there is. And so if you measure 7, it's going to collapse. You're not going to confirm it's in an odd cat. You're going to collapse everything to state 7. So we have to erase the information about the number and keep only the parity. And uh, I always run out of time to explain how we do that, but uh, we can do it 500 times in a row without damaging the state significantly. Uh, I'll explain in the questions if somebody's interested how we actually do it. But here's a use for it. Here, it turns out if you can measure parity, you can measure the density matrix. You can do the state tomography. And we're, this is actually the Wigner function, which is a kind of Fourier transform of the density matrix. There's a, there's a coordinate and a momentum that describes the state of the cavity, the electric field and the B field. And here is an even cat. And um, uh, this is data. I always have to tell the atomic physicist, yes, this is data, not simulation. Uh, and uh, what, what, are, what are those blob? What does that mean? Well, that blob there is the coherent state minus alpha. And so this is like um, probability distribution in phase space, but it's quasi-probability. It can be negative. That's the blue parts. And, uh, uh, but it's, you should think of it as a kind of semi-classical probability distribution. There's the plus alpha blob. Uh, you see that it's a point. It's not a blob. It's a blob, not a point. That's vacuum noise. You're seeing zero-point fluctuations of the vacuum right there. Okay. People build amplifiers today where you can just see it on an oscilloscope. You see these very um, uh, rapid fringes here. That proves that this is a coherent superposition, not a mixture. These are the whiskers of the cat. And uh, the fact that it's red in the middle means that's a, a, a plus sign. And we've done this with up to 111 photons, as I said, and still seeing fringes. So it turns out you use, uh, you displace the cavity and measure the parity, and, and that's how you get this uh, thing that's related to the density matrix. So you can do complete state tomography, whatever state you have, uh, with this trick. But again, I won't go into the details. Okay. So we want to use these cat states as the code words to store and correct our quantum information. So how do we do that? Well, we need two code words, zero logical and one logical. And uh, so zero logical is going to be this cat, this horizontal cat I just told you about. It's this position or that position of the oscillator. And the one code word is going to be this momentum or that momentum of the oscillator, cat state like that. And they're both going to have plus signs here. I'm using I alpha to represent the, the imaginary part of alpha to represent the momentum, and the real part to represent the position. Uh, 
they both have plus signs here, so they're both even paired. They have even photon number. They're eigenstates of parity. And even if I take a superposition, the psi 0 and the psi 1, uh, it's still an eigenstate, no matter what, uh, what superposition I take. There's a magic property that coherent states have, which is that they are eigenstates of the destruction operator. If I lose a photon, I'm in the same state. I'll just wait until that starts bothering you. <laughs> right? It's pretty amazing. And uh, so th that's a pretty nice feature of coherent states. Uh, that helps with our error correction because the state doesn't change when you lose a photon. Although, you know, you get a minus sign when it acts on here, so the even parity, of course, turns to odd parity when you lose a photon. But it's a very simple evolution under the error. It just changes parity. But the state itself doesn't change. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, this is a damped harmonic oscillator. How come when I'm emitting photons into the bath, I'm staying in the same state? So it turns out the damping of the oscillator happens when you don't see photons going out into the bath. Because when the dog doesn't bark at night, that's also a signal that updates your knowledge that the, there must have been fewer photons in that Poisson distribution than you thought. That's a whole other story. So, but this is the parity is the thing we can measure uh, with uh, in a Q and D <coughs> way, in a non-demolition way, uh, with uh, near nearly perfectly. So that's how we're going to tell if an error happens. We're going to store the information in a superposition of even parity words, and then just measure the parity. And if it ever jumps, then we know that the state switched. Uh, like this, in fact, here is uh, uh, what it does. So on this code word, it changes to odd parity. If it happens twice, it goes back to the original word. On the other code word, it changes to odd parity, but a factor of i comes out. If it happens twice, you get i squared. If it happens four times, you're back where you started. So if I, know, if I f monitor the parity continuously, and I know how many times it jumped mod 4, and I know which of four states I'm in, and I can correct for that. Uh, I don't have to do the error correction on the fly, only at the end of the storage time. So I choose one of four <coughs> different unitaries to figure out, to map the state back to its original state. So here's... Uh, 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 the quantum computer getting ready to be cooled down. There's a very fast uh, FPGA system in a computer which uh, sends all the signals, synthesizes the microwave signals, gets the signals back, makes a decision about whether the parity jumped or not, turns, uh, decides what to do next, and sends a signal down with a latency of about 200 nanoseconds. 15% of that latency is the speed of light travel time from the computer to the bottom of the doer and back again. So this is a very, very fast uh, uh, feedback processor. And so let's, uh, let's see how well it works. So here is putting the information not in the cavity, but in that transmon ancilla, which was not very good one, actually. The phase garnish time was only 15 microseconds. So I put it in. This is the process fidelity. I put the information in. I take it back out and see if it's the same. The process I want for a memory is the identity process. I want to get back what I put in. And it dies exponentially with that time scale. Now I'm going to uh, put it, the information into the cavity, but not in, a cr in the cat code, but just in a super, this is zero photon, that's one photon. And I'm going to use a, the same superposition. I'm going to just store it there. And immediately I get a factor of 20 gain in lifetime. That's because the cavity has a very, very high Q. That's not error correction, however. That's just using the best qubit in your, your toolbox to store the information. Also, if I ever lost a photon from this, 
uh, I would be in the vacuum state, I would have lost my quantum information. So this is the analog of like having the best single physical qubit, and that's the thing I have to beat with my error correction. I'm going to use a cat code that has more photons in it, so it has errors faster, but I'm going to use my Maxwell daemon to correct those and see if I can get back to this time. So beating this time is, is not, that's not the break even. You have to beat this time. So here is storing the information as a superposition of the two cat wor code words. And uh, you see you do worse by about a, fa a little over a factor of two, and that's because there were a little over more than two photons, two, twice as many photons in the cat states, and they get lost faster. But I haven't turned on the error correction yet, so that, this is the thing I have to beat to break even. If I turn on the error correction, uh, I just barely get past break even. I get to 320 microseconds, slightly, you know, 10% bigger than the cavity uh, lifetime. So just reach, or just slightly beat break even. If I, it turns out that this is a system that heralds its own errors. Uh, if, if uh, something happens to the ancilla controller in the middle, it tends to leave a whole pile of photons in the cavity at the end when it should have been empty, and we can detect that. That happens about 20% of the time. If I throw out that 20% of the data that's heralded errors, then I uh, beat uh, break even by nearly a factor of two. So it's, yes, it's partly cheating to throw out that data. In another sense, it's not because this is a a heralded error is a, what's called an erasure channel in the quantum information world. It, if you know there was an error and where it happened, it's very easy to write codes where you would have several of these cavities and you would know, you would know what to ignore in the, in the one that, that went bad. It's very easy to correct those kinds of errors. So it's not completely cheating to say that, uh, uh, th th I mean, this is a meaningful number in that uh, in that context. So, as I said, this is the first experiment to actually reach the break-even point in any technology, ion traps, NB centers, um, cold atoms, supernatant qubits, and so forth. It's not just a quantum memory, but you can make uh, the zero logical and the one logical, and, and you can rotate among them and put anywhere on the logical block sphere and produce arbitrary superpositions of them. Uh, and so uh, we've also done two cavities with this and f entangled two cavities while they're logically encoded with these words. So we're, we're climbing up this staircase of things that you have to do on the way to building a large-scale fault-tolerant uh, quantum computer. So we've reached the break-even point for memory, where the lifetime of the memory is larger than any of the physical qubits in it. We've done logical operations on those logical qubits, and we've started to do entangling operations. Again, uh, you know, with sort of one nine of, of fidelity, so we still have lots of work to do before we uh, get up to here. And we need to do much more than just break even, or it's not worth the trouble of, of doing all of this, right? So we need to uh, get 10 or 100 times uh, past the break-even point, and that's, that's our next uh, challenge. So, um, but we feel like we're making progress here, the papers that uh, describe it, and I'm happy to take questions. understood correctly, but it seemed like zero and one, logical zero and logical one are related by alpha to I alpha. Uh, yes, so... Um, that, that, that's a time evolution. Well, it? yes, uh, although, okay, good. So, but I'm in some funny rotating frame where they don't, they actually wrote, they actually just, uh, think of it, if it uh, as um, uh, the cosine amplitude of some wave and the sine amplitude, sine omega t and cosine omega t. Yeah. Yes, in some frame they rotate into each other, but it, um, 
they're actually orthogonal states. Sure, but, but it means that you need a good time resolution to yeah, oh yeah. So so all of our microwave generators are slave to atomic clocks and uh, things, you know, uh, uh, unlike lasers, you can just make uh, microwaves have very precise phase control and you can phase lock things at very different frequencies. And yeah, there's a lot of stuff under the hood that I didn't talk about, but yes. <laughs> It's it's easy-ish. <laughs> it's easy for a theorist to say it's easy. So is this uh, implementation, this error correction, uh, requires energy because you have this um, demon. Yes. Is it has to be fast, yes. Et yes. So this is not a memory that will remain in a switch something else, not like a magnetic memory. No, no. Uh, it's not, and uh, it, it'll never be. <laughs> yeah. So, um, is, it, is this a correct statement that uh, if you measure the parity very quickly, yeah. then you can expand your lifetime of your qubit infinitely? So, if, if you can... Yeah, so, um, so uh, a common misconception is that if you have error, error correction, you can make it an immortal qubit. So that you can't do. Uh, there's always something. So if you measure the parity very, very frequently, then it's extremely unlikely that in the short interval between measurements, there would be two parity jumps. If there were two, you would think there were zero, right? You, you would miss the fact that the parity jumped. And so there's always some uncorrectable error. But if the error for, if the, in a short time interval, the probability is epsilon of getting a jump, and I'm capturing all the single jumps, it's only order epsilon squared that there'll be two jumps that I'll miss. So you, all error correction consists of replacing epsilons by epsilon squareds. You know, the lifetime gets longer, but not infinitely longer. So, so w w what is the challenge here? So um, if, if we make our cavity, the Q of cavity very long, yeah. so, um, and we can do this, uh, parity checking quickly, yep. then problem solved. So, yeah. uh, so why is it that we only barely broke even? Why didn't we make it, you know, thousand times better? So uh, it turns out there's just all kinds of little things. So, so the, um, the parity measurement has very high fidelity, 98% fidelity and 99.8% uh, and Dina's no. So 98%, so one time in 50, you're going to assign the parity incorrectly. And then you're going to think there's an error when there isn't, and you're going to correct for it, which makes an error. So that's a problem. Uh, about 1% of the time, the ancilla, which has a shorter lifetime than the cavity, but I use that ancilla to measure the parity, uh, every once in a while, it, it falls down, uh, has a T1 event, falls to the ground state. That causes a complete failure. Uh, that's the thing which is uh, uh, heralded, that it causes a complete mess up in the whole system. Um, so uh, there's just little things which you, you know, it's surprisingly hard to do. I mean, uh, uh, quantum optics people would just be amazed to be able to measure the parity at all, and with 98% fidelity, it would be totally amazing. It's very good, but it, you know, if we could make it 99.9% .9 fidelity parity measurement, we would gain a lot of, uh, we'd go way past uh, break even. That and a couple other things are, dominate our error budget. So that's you know the current uh, uh, frontier that we're trying to do next. It's, uh, error correction is very, very hard. Uh, is, it, uh, is it okay, I guess, to think about uh, another possibility with phonons, to just have it all solved this state and not with photons? Yeah, so, um, so I was uh, um, mentioning to somebody, Andrew maybe, uh, today that um, uh, Rob Sholkoff and another colleague, Peter Rinkich, have a way of replacing the microwave resonator with a phone acoustic resonator. And the speed of sound is 
much lower, so it can be a very small resonator, just a thin sheet of sapphire. And um, we think we can get the phonon <coughs> cues of a billion if we're <coughs> lucky. Uh, and they've gotten to the point where they can transfer the quantum information from the transmon to a superposition of zero and one phonon and get it back. But not with fantastic fidelity, you know, one nine of fidelity or something. But the scalability is much easier, I guess. There. Uh, yeah, although people always say, oh, how can you build a quantum scalable quantum computer with these centimeter scale resonators? They're so big. But as Rob Shulkoff likes to say, you know, you can buy a cubic meter dill fridge, and in a cubic meter, there's a million cubic centimeters. So <laughs> it's going to be a long time before we run out of space. And if we get if we have that problem, I'll be very happy. <laughs> so what's the gate definition with uh, these path states? So for example, z. Right. So um, so that um, zero is this cat and one is that cat. Uh, if you can change the cavity frequency momentarily, you'll process this into that. In, in so that's how you do a Z gate. Um, X gates are, and Y gates are more complicated. Uh, and um, what the students do is they, they write down, they take the Hamiltonian with the nonlinear ancilla and this thing, and they just put in crazy pulse sequences and keep tweaking them and feeding back until it does whatever gate you want, and then they say, uh, they bring it to their advisor and say, look, it works. And the advisor says, why? And they say, we don't care, it works. <laughs> um, and so it is, you can prove that it's controllable and therefore you can do this. But uh, I have to say, understanding how the pulse sequences that are, dr you drive the cavity and the qubit at the same time and it makes those gates, but it looks like a mess, but it works. I, that's the best I can do. I don't like that explanation because it's not an explanation. Kind of by hand, like heuristically. What's that? These pulse sequences—is that kind of heuristically playing around until they find it, or? They uh, no. So there's this thing called a grape it. algorithm where you use some gradient descent thing where you just try to you uh, aiming for a certain unitary and the deviations from that you just keep making smaller by making random tweaks in the pulses until it works. It's sort of crazy, but it works. Yeah. Any other questions? Could you please tell me, Intel, IBM, Google, uh, do they use Transmon? No. Yeah, so um, e every group in the world in academia and uh, industry uses that Transmon, that qubit because it's the world's simplest. So the phase qubit is dead? <coughs> uh, okay. Yeah, the phase qubits, um, well, not completely dead, but they, as originally designed, they're extremely sensitive to flux, magnetic flux noise. Uh, Michel Deveret has some thing he calls flexonium, which has kind of like a phase qubit, but it's much less sensitive to phase noise. There, there are others around, but right now, uh, everybody that's making more than one of them at a time <laughs> is using the transmon because it's so simple. How do you actually make uh, calculations with photonic qubits since photons don't interact very much? So, um, so, so uh, good question. So, this is a, it's a quantum engineering problem. Things that are very coherent are very coherent because they don't interact. And so, how do you, you know, get things that are coherent that you can do logical operations? So, how did we entangle? two harmonic oscillators, two cavities, uh, when, the, when the photons don't interact very much. Well, they, they get an induced interaction by the nonlinear ancilla that's coupling them. So one photon could virtually hop into the ancilla. That changes the frequency that the other photon sees when it tries to hop in. And that induces a strong interaction between the photons. So it's like having, uh, in nonlinear optics, you have a uh, chi-2 or chi-3 medium where uh, you can get three-wave or four-wave mixing and, and get down conversion of photons and things. 
that this is like having an ultra strong version of that. So okay, I think we should now stop. Okay, uh, take more questions after. Yes, and there's wine and cheese on the eighth floor. Please join us for that, and let's thank Steve for wine.